everybody, I hope you're doing well. So today we're going to jump right into Paul's Graph v. Long Island Railroad Company. Now this case is a torts case, more specifically a negligence case, and it's the one that people talk about when they want to have a conversation about something called proximate cause. We're going to get into what that is, but before we talk about the actual facts of this case and the underlying law, a little talk about what a tort is is going to make life a bit easier. So in the common law countries, we tend to split things into criminal and torts. So criminal, everybody kind of has an idea of that. That's assault and battery, that's theft, robbery, arson, all the things that make up the great true crime novels. The tort side is what happens between the two individuals or more that you talk about when you sue somebody. Now, the two can actually walk side by side with one another, but they're handled in two different ways. So the tort, let's say for example, I steal your favorite lawn chair. I'm tired of standing, I see the chair, I like it, I want it, I take your chair. On the criminal side of things, that's theft in whatever variety your jurisdiction has. On the tort side, it is conversion. So you can call the police, have me arrested for theft, and then the judicial system handles that. You can then turn around, hire a lawyer, and sue me for conversion for whatever damages you seek. So that's the basic difference. And negligence is one of these torts. You probably know negligence more as something like a slip and fall on a banana. But with that kind of undergirding taken care of, let's look at the case itself. It's going to help to keep in mind that we have three actors sort of working together in this particular case. You have Helen Paul's graph, who is the plaintiff. You have Mr. Rando, who's just this guy running down the platform. And then you have the railroad company represented by its two employees who acted on the day that we're going to talk about. And that was on August 24th of 1924. Helen Paul's graph decided to be a nice mother and take her two children to the beach that day. So they went to the train station and having paid their fare, were waiting on the platform at the East New York station in Brooklyn. Now a train came up the rails to the platform and it wasn't theirs. Happens the hustle and bustle, people are on, people are off, there's all kinds of movement, and the train starts to pull away. Well, as also happens, two men came running up the platform trying to catch the train before it pulled out of the station. One of them made it. He got onto the train. Number two, Rando, didn't. He was having some trouble. He was running, running, running. One railroad worker on the train reached out to grab a hold of him to pull him on. Railroad worker number two was giving him a shove from behind. What nobody noticed at the time, though, was that Rando had a newspaper wrapped something in his hand. And when the railroad worker gave him a shove to get him on the train, it fell. Turns out it was a bunch of fireworks. And as explosives tend to do, when they hit the platform, they blew up. And the resulting shock waves ended up actually knocking over a luggage scale that was on the other side of the platform where Helen Paul's graph happened to be standing with her daughters. Now the scale fell over, hit Helen, and gave her some relatively minor injuries. As a result of this, she ended up developing something of a stammer and she sued the railway company for negligence. She actually won the initial suit though, and the railway company then appealed, and we end up at what is the highest court in New York. Now to prove her negligence claim, Helen Paul's graph has to show all of the elements, and there are four of them for negligence. It's that there's a duty, there was a breach of that duty, causation, and damages. And causation itself is actually then split into two pieces, cause and fact, and proximate cause. But the judge actually looked and started at the front end with duty. And he found that there has to be a duty and that has to come first before you can have anything else. Doesn't matter if there's any causation or damages if there was no duty to begin with. And so in doing so, he looked primarily at two particular issues. One, how to define a duty, 
and two, to whom that duty is going to be owed. So in looking at how to define a duty owed, and the judge found that proof of negligence in the air, so to speak, will not do. In short, it's not good enough that you happen to be around and something goes wrong. What an individual has to show is that there is a wrong to herself himself, as in something was done specifically to you. Your right was violated in some way, not simply that there was a wrong done to someone else, not even conduct wrongful because unsocial, but not a wrong to any particular person. So in short, you don't get to reach into someone else's life take a duty that's owed to them and sue on your own behalf. What he ended up saying to sort of illustrate this issue is that if you go forward and you jostle somebody in a crowd, you have interfered with that one person, but you haven't interfered with anyone else around them. The crowd has no claim of duty from you because you jostled one person. But if you jostle person number one and they drop, say, a bomb and that bomb goes off and hurts the people around him, the guy that dropped the bomb now may have a problem when it comes to duty related to everybody else. They had a duty of care from him. He knew he had an explosive and he dropped it and it went kerfooey. So let's apply that concept to this case. The judge found that if there was a duty of care, it was from the railway worker to Rando. So the railway worker shoved Rando. In shoving Rando, Rando drops the fireworks. Rando is the one touched. Rando is the one whose property is destroyed. Rando is the one to whom the railway worker owed the duty of care. Not Paul's graph. She was hanging out at the complete other end of the station. It had nothing to do with her. She wasn't touched. She wasn't bothered. She was just standing somewhere else in the general vicinity. Not unlike the crowd were you to jostle person number one who carried the bomb, which then highlights part of the problem. Paul's graph picked the wrong person to sue. So what door do you want? Uh, I'll take uh, three. She sued the person that did the jostling the railway company. She failed to sue the person that actually owed her the duty, the person who knew he was carrying the fireworks. So having figured out how to define the duty that's going to be owed, the judge then looks at to whom this duty is going to be owed. And this is where proximate and the proximate cause kind of kicks in. And the judge found that the orbit of the danger as disclosed to the eye of the reasonable vigilance would be the orbit of the duty. And that is the essence of proximate cause. What it ends up meaning is that people are responsible for their own actions. We go out into the world and we do things and we are responsible for what we do and for the consequences of what we do. But it's to the extent that you could foresee the danger of those actions. And that but, the foreseeing of it, has to be reasonable. And to make that determination, the law created something called the reasonable man. It's this hypothetical bro who runs around in the courtrooms deciding for us what a reasonable person would think, do, say, believe in a particular set of circumstances. He's really boring to go and get a beer with. And so with that idea in mind, the concept is, is that the risk has to reasonably be perceived and that perception defines the duty to be obeyed. So the risk imports relation. It's risk to another or to others within the range of apprehension. It'll make a little bit more sense in a second. The judge kind of rounds it out by saying that if there's no hazard that was apparent to the eye of ordinary vigilance, so that reasonable man, an act innocent and harmless, at least to an outside seeming, right, an outside person with reference to her, in this case, Paul's graph, and did not take into itself the quality of a tort because it happened to be a wrong. So taking all that and applying it to this case, what the judge is basically saying is that the railway worker was trying to be nice. He was trying to be helpful and what he did was not illegal. He was giving Rando a bump up onto the train. Now, yes, he was negligent in doing so. Rando's property fell and exploded. But what he did was harmless. It was seemingly lawful and kind. But don't forget, the newspaper obscured the fireworks. All that the train worker knew was that there was a customer running for the train 
he was going to miss the train. The paper wasn't smoking. It wasn't covered in blood. It wasn't exploding. It wasn't sizzling. There was nothing about what the train worker could see that indicated any kind of damage, harm, or danger. And it's not considered reasonable to assume that a newspaper wrapped something in someone's hand is an explosive. And so this particular incident, while perhaps a wrong, is outside of that orbit of the danger as disclosed to the eye of reasonable vigilance. It's not reasonable to assume this could have happened. So the judge isn't going to say that the railway worker owed a duty to the people in the area to prevent an explosion. Or to sum it all up, there was no proximate causation between the railway worker giving Rando a bump and the scale falling over and hitting Mrs. Paul's graph. It was too far apart. So at the end of the day, the court said, sorry ma'am, you lose, and the court actually reversed the lower decision and found in favor of the railway company. And just to add a little bit of insult to injury, she was ordered to pay costs of the litigation, and she had to pay the railway in excess of $500 at the time, though I couldn't find any indication that she actually had paid it. So what happened to Helen Paul's graph after the decision? Well, her health was never really great after the initial explosion and the stammering, which did remain until she later just became mute altogether. Um, her health was not great, and she lived with one of her daughters until she died in October of 1945. So that was Paul's Graph v. Long Island Railroad Company and Proximate Cause and Negligence Claims. I hope you enjoyed the video. I particularly hated this case in law school. It took me forever to understand what was going on, but I hope you don't mind it too much. Go ahead and reach out in the comment section below and let me know what you think of Judge Cardozo's analysis, in particular about the orbit. Is the idea itself of proximate cause a reasonable one, or should you be held strictly liable for the results of your actions, regardless of how novel or extraordinary it may be? I'd love to know what you think, but until we are together again, I hope everyone is well.